All right, so welcome back. I hope you guys had a good weekend. Uh, Monday mornings are always, always tough. What else is new, right? So it is, it is what it is, 8 a.m. class. We, we do the best we can. Hopefully coffee and, and tea will, will help you through. Today we're going to talk about digital photography. I say photography in general because obviously the stuff that I'll talk about today would apply to film photography, though most of you are like, what is film? And that's to be expected in this day and age. So uh, it is specifically digital photography that I'll talk about. Some of the things are specific to it. The rest of it is, is more generic. But to me, I do a little bit of a departure before we get into Photoshop. And I talk about digital photography and what it means to go out and actually shoot pictures and how do you compose pictures and that sort of thing. Because those fundamental principles will help you as you go through your architectural design career or your design career in general because principles of composition don't change. That's certainly something you can use down the road. You're doing a poster, you can do the same thing. You're doing a rendering, you compose it. Uh, so learning about photography is not a bad place to start. It also means that we can start with photos that you actually take. If I gave you photos and said, yeah, here's what you're going to work with, you don't get as much out of it. If you actually go out and take the photos, and then we work with those photos specifically in Photoshop, you learn what kinds of corrections you typically would need to make uh, and how to make those corrections better. So we start with this basic definition of terms so that we have an even playing field. Anybody a professional photographer in here? No? I've asked that question before, and I've had somebody who is a professional photographer. And it's like, OK, well, this is awkward, because I'm not, and I'm, here I am lecturing on what you do for a living. Um, but it happens, and so I always like to, to find out ahead of time if anybody is. It changes how I talk, I guess, a little bit, or at least I would reference that person and say, do you agree with what I'm saying? But now I'm just, I get to be right, so I guess life is easy for me today, right? So we start with something called the camera body, and what this is is it's a light-proof box that contains some kind of photosensitive material or light-sensitive material. And that light-proof box could be something like a big digital SLR. It could be something as simple as your phone. right? That would work and, and do the same thing. What we need is some way of controlling the light and how it comes in and making sure that that photosensitive material, whatever it is, in the case of a digital camera, it would be a chip, is not exposed to light all the time. And when it is, it captures the photo. Then we move on to something called aperture. And this is what controls a lot of what the photo looks like. But it also is fundamentally about how much light can physically get into the camera body itself. And so this is uh, the opening that is in the lens that limits how much light gets into the camera. Okay? And so if we look at the, the old school lens, right, something like this, which is you know, the big thing that you attach to a camera that people don't seem to see too much anymore because it's built in. If we were to look at it, we could see very easily that depending on the aperture itself, maybe. Oh, come on. There we go. Could we move any faster here, right? OK. <sighs> depending on the aperture itself, we could end up with a very large hole in the center of the lens that lets a lot of light in. Or we could end up with a little, little bitty tiny hole that lets a small amount of light in. And so this matters in two ways. One, let's say we were taking a picture in a dark room and we didn't have a flash. Obviously, if we're using something like this one, that would be good because more light could get into the camera. So with an f1.8 lens or something like that, uh, f1.8 is an f-stop. I'll talk about that in a second. It's just a designator for what an aperture size is. But let's say we're using an f1.8 or an f1.4, big wide open lens, a lot of light coming in we could shoot in a relatively dark room with no flash, which could be an advantage. Right? Sometimes flashes don't really look that good when we take pictures, so we can end up having an advantage. If we were outside in really bright sunlight, in snow, for example, letting a bunch of light in might not be the right strategy. We want a little bit of light, so the aperture gets smaller, and we use that smaller aperture. Okay? As we move forward here, the other thing that aperture controls is something called depth of field. And you've probably seen photographs like this before, which have this kind of really cool blurred background. It looks like just colors behind. Okay? The aperture is what controls the amount of the image that's in focus. And we call this depth of field, and I'll show a slide that kind of represents this a little bit better, uh, because we have, in this case, a very shallow depth of field, just the leaf itself 
is exposed correctly, right? And everything behind it is blurred and everything in front of it is blurred. On the other hand, we can have the opposite with a really tiny aperture. So let's look at these in contrast, okay? This is that f-stop number. And it's kind of, f-stop is con confusing because it's an inverse number. So a really small f number, so f 1.8, 1.4, something like that, means the aperture is really big, a lot of light coming in. The opposite, this is an f8, you could have an f16, an f32. No, I'm not talking about fighter jets, I'm talking about apertures, okay? But if we had an f16 or something like that, this, the hole in the lens is really small, and it means that the bulk of what we're shooting, in this case the landscape, is all in focus. So if we were shooting a landscape like this, we're out on the California coast, we want to capture this view, we wouldn't want a shallow depth of field, right? We wouldn't want just a little bit of the image to be in focus and the rest of it to be blurry or just colors. So controlling this concept via the aperture is one of the most important things you can learn as an amateur photographer. Okay? So controlling what part of it is in focus. When you move on and you take 136 and we deal with Rhino, we actually talk about how to fake this when we do renderings. It's something called Z-depth, and we can actually fake it so that it looks like a real photograph. All right, so it's something to be aware of as you go forward. Okay, this illustration is probably the best, clearest way of, of talking through this. On the left here, we have an F16. Okay, and as we look at that, the bulk of the tape measure is in focus. Right, we can see we can see the numbers, you know, going forward and backwards. There we go, like that, relatively easily. Okay? If we drop over here to this one at the end, the f1.4, really wide open, a lot of light coming in, right? you can see that our depth of field is really only a matter of a couple centimeters. Right? It's very, very shallow. Everything behind it is blurry, and everything in front of it is very blurry. Okay? So controlling where that focal point is does matter. If we were shooting a, an overall composition, you would want the dog's nose to be exposed properly, or the leaf or the flower to be exposed properly. So it has to be in that very shallow depth of field. You have to pay attention while you're shooting. Does this make sense? Okay, the correlation between how much light comes in and the depth of field. Shutter speed is the other big thing that we, that we talk about. Okay? And it basically means how long is the light sensitive material exposed to light? Okay? So if it's really quick, it tends to freeze motion. And if it's really slow, it tends to be blurring motion. Okay? And I'll show you a bunch of examples later on. It's generally in the 1 tenth to 1 1 thousandth of a second. So it's really, really short in its duration. Okay? Typical exposure is 125th of a second. So very, very quick. So what does this mean? We'll start with 1 50th of a second. Obviously, we could go up from there and make it even, a, even faster. But if we start with 1 50th of a second and we look at this particular image, okay, it, look at right in here at the, the individual drops of water, you can actually see some of the little splashes that are in here, you know, little tiny splashes, etc. cetera. Okay? Furthermore, we can very clearly see at the bottom all of the individual waves. They're frozen in time. So it's a way of freezing motion. If we jump forward, okay, notice that the water starts to get a little bit smoother. We don't see the individual drops anymore. Okay, this is one tenth of a second, starting to blend together. The bottom, though, we still see the individual little ripples in the pool. Okay, let's jump forward a, a, another one. This is a half second. The the water is almost wispy. It's really starting to get blurry, right over the motion there. The pool itself is starting to get a little bit smoother. Let's go forward again. One second of exposure. Okay. The bottom of the pool, all the ripples have almost blended together. It's starting to be very smooth. Obviously, the, the waterfall itself is very, very streaky. Right? So as we change this, we're getting different results. Okay? Let's look at this in contrast. 160th of a second. Same scene, same wave, or close to it. Right? We have on the 1 160th of a second. We've got this spray frozen in midair, all the individual little droplets. Right? We capture that action. 
On the other hand, this is a four second exposure and all of the waves have blurred together, right, to create kind of this, this very smooth ocean. Furthermore, we have kind of a mist almost that's right in here. So there's no individual droplets or spray or anything like that. It's all smoothed out. Okay? Neither one of these is correct or incorrect. Right? They're both great photos. It just has to do with what are you trying to show. Right? Let's say you wanted to capture somebody playing sports. Right? Chances are you'd want to use a really what shutter speed? really fast shutter speed because you want to freeze that motion. Okay? On the other hand, maybe you were trying to capture, um, you know, it was, a, it was an evening shot and you wanted to capture the tail lights of cars as they, they went forward and backwards on a road or something like that. You would want the opposite. You'd want a long exposure so you'd get those light streaks. Okay? So you want to think about what are you trying to photograph and what is the end result going to be? Oops. So the other thing that's in a digital camera is something called ISO, which is essentially what the old days called film speed. And you used to go to the store, and I know this is going to sound really old fashioned, right? You used to go, it was mostly like a drugstore. You'd go to a drugstore and you'd say, I need to buy some film. And you'd have a choice. You'd have ISO 100, you'd have ISO 200, you'd have ISO 400, and you'd have ISO 800, or maybe one that was higher. And what it had to do with was the film itself had different light sensitivity values. So if you wanted to shoot action shots, high speed, freeze the action, you might shoot at a higher ISO. If you wanted to shoot you know, landscape or something that didn't move, you might shoot it at an ISO 100. Digital cameras have a way of mimicking this. And all it's doing is adjusting the sensitivity of the sensor in the camera itself. Is it more or less sensitive to light? And this can matter when we're trying to shoot pictures and I'll show you the example in just a second, when you shoot a picture that looks like this. Anybody ever shot something like this? Probably from your cell phone, right? You get all these little red and green splotches on the image. Okay? The reason that you get these splotches is because the camera, or the phone in this case, changed the ISO way up to compensate for low light. So there's not a lot of light in the room. I still want to be able to take the photo. I can't turn the flash on, or I don't have the flash turned on. I'm going to compensate, make the photo sensor really, really sensitive so that tiny little bit of light that comes in, I still get an image. And if, such is light. The image is a little bit better, not on the screen. But, okay. but we end up with all these little pixels. That pixel noise right, is the, the artifacting that's happening in the sensor. It's too sensitive. It gets some of the colors wrong. Okay. The better the camera, the higher you can shoot in ISO without those little pixels, without that noise. So something like this is shot with a digital SLR. It has an ISO of 1600, which is still very high, very sensitive sensor. But because it's a high quality camera with a larger sensor, we get no noise. Okay? If you were to take uh, your phone, your iPhone, or your Android phone, and uh, shoot at ISO 1600, you'd get the noise. Because the sensor, I mean, think about it. right? You got that little, little bitty tiny lens. Right? How big can the sensor really be? Digital SLR, you got a much bigger sensor. You can shoot at a higher ISO. So here's an example where we see them side by side. ISO 100 through 3200. And you can see how much clearer the ISO 100 is and how it really blurs out by the time we get to the end at the 1600, or, or in this case, the 3200. Right? So that noise increases as we increase that sensitivity. White balance is the other thing that happens in the digital world. It only applies to digital cameras, not film cameras. And it's an adjustment to the color. Anybody ever taken a photograph that looked like it was underwater? It was really blue in color, right? Maybe something like this on the left, right? This means that the ISO is incorrect. Or excuse me, this means that the white balance is incorrect. Okay? What white balance is is it says, OK, take what white is and make it actually white. Don't make it kind of orangey white, don't make it bluish white. And if the camera screws up, right, you might end up with something like this. Picture of New York, looks like it's underwater because everything is tinted blue. The correct would be on the right in terms of the white balance. So white is correct in this image. And actually, we could look at it, say, uh, on the sidewalk maybe. Right, if we looked at 
right there, that would be white, right? Right here in the same spot on this image is white as well, but that white is blue, right? It has a bluish tint. This white is actual white. Does that make sense? So we're adjusting what white really is. So that's white balance, really easy to adjust in Photoshop after the fact. So if you screw it up, no big deal. We can shift the color of the photo. Okay? Bracketing means deliberately taking a series of exposures that we can then combine together to create something called a high dynamic range image, which I will actually talk about in class in a couple, uh, I think it's a week and a half or something like that, okay? in terms of what a high dynamic range image is. But we have to take three, five, or seven images. The idea is that the first image is correctly exposed, the second image is deliberately darker, and the third image is deliberately lighter. And the reason that these kinds of things happen is we might want to photograph a sunset. Anybody tried to photograph a sunset and have it not look like the sunset? Right? Most of the time, if you go to take a picture of the sunset, it won't actually look like what you see. And that's because our eyes and our brains are really good at processing dynamic range. So we're sitting in this classroom, okay, and you can look down at the floor under the computers and you can see all the detail that's in the shadow, that's in the darkness, right? If you do that. And if you really quickly look up and look outside, your brains and your eyes compensate quickly and you can see all the detail that's outside. So we see in something called high dynamic range. We can see darks and lights and our brains process those differences. In a photograph, it's fixed. You take the exposure, right? In this case, I expose for the shadow under the desks. I can see the detail there, but anything that's bright gets washed out completely. The opposite is true. I take a picture of outside and I get that exposed nicely. If I were to see anything that was dark and in the shadows, I'd see no detail, it'd be just black. So this dynamic range, we can compensate for using the bracketing technique and then putting the images together in Photoshop afterward. So something like this, or even something like this. Right? These are high dynamic range images. Like I said, I'll show you a bunch. We'll talk specifically in a lecture about high dynamic range, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you a bunch of examples at that point. Aperture and shutter speed have an inverse relationship. Right? Half the shutter speed equals two times the aperture to get the same amount of light in. Right? So you decrease the shutter speed. Okay? You end up having to compensate to let more light in by increasing the aperture. Okay? So an f11 at 1 60th of a second is equivalent to f8 at 1 125th of a second. Okay? Do you need to remember this stuff? No, because your camera will do this for you automatically. So we have something called exposure values. And if we were in a true photography class, right? we'd spend a bunch of time talking about what these mean and how we'd get there. Okay? You'd have to memorize this. You'd shoot in full manual mode. The good news for you is this isn't a photography class. Okay? But I like to, ex to talk through this a little bit just so that you're aware of it. Okay? So the exposure value is on the left here. Let me try to draw on this. All right, so right here is our exposure value. right? And I'll tell you how you get the exposure value in just a second. And with that exposure value, you can look at the aperture, which is across here, right, right along there. And you can come down and decide if I wanted an exposure value of 6 and I wanted an aperture of 2, I could cross them and my shutter speed should be 1 15th of a second. Right? So this is a manual table for figuring out what your exposure should be. So this is how you determine your exposure value. So your exposure value is a set number depending on the type of scene you're shooting. So let's say I wanted to, to, to shoot some pictures of an amusement park. Ah, sorry. Right? There's my amusement park. My exposure value is 7. So I'd go back. Oops. Right there. My exposure value of 7 is right here. And then I'd look for my aperture. Oh, I want to shoot in 2.8. And I'd come down. And I'd say, oh, there it is, 1 15th of a second. Right? That's how I'd figure out and calculate what these settings are. The good news is our cameras can do all of this for us, and we don't have to worry about it, which is good. Okay? We also have something that is often confused with exposure value. It's called exposure compensation. And this is something that even your iPhone does. 
and you may or may not have experienced it before. This is deliberately under or overexposing an image. So if you've ever shot with your iPhone, right, you tap and hold on the screen and you drag up or drag down and it darkens or lightens the image, right? That's what this is. It's saying take the initial shot, what you think is correct, and then make it darker or make it lighter on purpose, okay? Exposure compensation happens in every camera. The digital cameras, uh, sometimes you can do a, like a plus 1.0, plus 1.7, or something like that, or a minus, and it does the same thing through the little scroll wheels. So you have this as an option, and it allows you basically to override what the default camera setting would be. So here's an example, right? We wanted to make it darker, we can go to minus two. Our standard exposure is at zero. Our increased exposure would be at plus one. Okay, so it's, a, it's from zero, it's either a negative or a positive. Negative darkens, positive lightens. So a few notes on lighting, and I think that this is, this is something that's important to, to discuss a little bit, in that depending on what you're trying to shoot or what photograph you're trying to take, you may or may not want to shoot at a particular time of day. And I think the best example I have is uh, when I was an undergrad, this is a million years ago, right, because I'm ancient. I did a field school in Peru. We went and traveled to Peru, um, and we did a bunch of archaeology work on a site that was in the kind of the flatlands uh, of Peru, not up in the mountains. And we went there, and it was a combination of architecture students and archaeology students. And it was, it was interesting. We took a class uh, in the semester before we went on this trip. We went during the summer, and we learned a bunch about site documentation and whatever. It was interesting. It was a really cool class. And so we went to Peru. And we would go to this site, and we spent all day at the site. We'd get there at like 7 in the morning, and we'd leave at 7 at night. And um, so we'd, we'd arrive, and all the archaeology people would be like, ah, let's sit around and have a cup of coffee. No big deal. We don't need to do anything. All the architecture people's like, oh, man, the light's awesome. It's, it's shining through the, the, the mud dwellings this way, and we can get all these shadows, and this would be great. And we got a photograph, and we're out there doing our thing. Then at noon, all the architecture people were like, yeah, let's take a nap, let's have lunch, no big deal. And all the archaeology students were out there saying, the lighting is perfect. It's perfectly even. We can capture the colors on the walls really well. Like, there's no shadows. This is perfect. Okay, so we each had a different opinion about what time of day was the right time to be shooting because we had different goals. And so it's important to recognize that the goals change, and therefore the time that you're shooting might change. So think about, look at what the lighting is like and take advantage of that. So let's talk a little bit about um, file formats. You guys are probably all familiar with JPEGs by now. It's the Joint Photographic Experts Group that came up with this file format. Okay? It's the most common type of photograph uh, that's available online, digital photograph. Uh, the files are compressed, losing a bunch of information. So this works a lot like MP3s, uh, where we take the file and we deliberately strip out a bunch of information that we can't see, or that's extra. And that makes the file size significantly smaller, maybe one-tenth of what it would be in its full size. So we compress the size down, makes it really easy to email and send back and forth, all right? And that can be a good thing. The problem is, if we go take it to a print shop and we want to have the image blown up to be really big, it's not going to turn out very well because we got rid of a bunch of the data, okay? PNG came along, which is a portable networks graphic. We will use this in this class along with JPEGs. Um, this allows for compression without losing information. So we can, we can keep the, the full information in a particular uh, image. It's the most common lossless, so not losing information, file format. Right? JPEG, PNG are the most common. The reason we will use it in this class is because it supports transparency. So if you make a background transparent, you get rid of a background, you save it, it will preserve that transparency. And you can actually see this. Well, it's kind of hard to see. You might not be able to see it. I can see it really easy on this, where we can, the background of this image is white. It's sitting on top of my slide. The PNG file here right, has a completely transparent background, so we can't see the white anymore. Okay, So it's worth being aware of. We move forward into something called a TIFF a tagged image file format. Uh, the TIFF is very uh, good in terms of it doesn't lose anything, kind of like a PNG. Uh, it preserves a lot of the data. 
and it's very popular for high depth colors. So if we did a high dynamic range image and we compiled three images together into one, TIFF is the general result of that. Okay? Again, we can always strip it down into a JPEG. We can do a save as and we can get the JPEG. Um, it's very unusual for a TIFF to come directly out of anything. You're not going to get a TIFF out of your phone. You would have to actually create it or build it. And then we get to the last one, and that's a raw image. Anybody heard of a raw image before? Right? OK. Maybe not. Uh, a raw image is not going to come out of your, your phone, but it could come out of a digital SLR camera or even a point and shoot camera. And the idea behind a raw image is every piece of information that the digital camera captures is stored in that file. It's the equivalent of a negative on film. So everything that it, it shoots gets captured. It's much, much bigger right, than a JPEG or a PNG. So you're sacrificing space. Let's say a JPEG is 1 to 2 megabytes. Uh, a raw image might be 14 to 16 megabytes. So per image, it's a lot bigger. It, re it gives us a lot more flexibility in how we post-process the image. We can recover from a lot of mistakes and get information back, which is one of the big um, advantages. It does require special decoding software to, to actually decode it, built into things like Photoshop so you don't even think about it. Okay? So why is this relevant? We have this image on the left, and this is an overexposed image. Okay? If we look at it, we don't really have a lot of detail in the white. right? The red's OK, but the white is almost completely washed out. If we go into Photoshop and we try to correct the exposure, or in this case, I did it in Aperture, which is another photo management program. If we try to correct it, it ends up kind of dull. Right? We get a little bit of information back. Obviously, we see more of the wood grain in here. We see a little bit of the, the, the peeling paint, but it's, it's not that good. Okay? So that was a JPEG trying to correct. If, however, we took the same image, this was a raw image, and we corrected the exposure on the raw image, look at the difference. Right? We get all the detail back. Because the camera captured everything, we have everything to go back to. So it's a big advantage in post-processing to shoot in raw. Okay? So it may or may not be something that's worth you doing. If I shoot, I shoot in raw. Right? Obviously, if you shoot with your phone, you're not going to shoot in RAW. You're going to shoot in JPEGs, because that's what the option is. Okay? So your camera. A little bit of an overview of your camera. Your camera has a sensor in it. This is that light-sensitive material that's sitting inside your camera. It can be larger or smaller, depending on whether your camera is a phone or whether it's a digital SLR. And basically, what it's doing is it has a light-sensitive material over that material is a grid of colors, okay? red, green, and blue colors. And as that grid of colors is exposed to light, individual pixels on the, on the sensor right, pick up, this is a red color, this is a blue color, this is a green color, okay? the three pr primary colors of light, or some combination of the three. Okay? So when it picks up that information, right, all of those little, those little dots make up your overall image. So when we talk about how many megapixel your camera is, right? That's how many of these little colors show up in your final image. Okay? How many little pieces um, pick up sensor information on your camera. So we take it a step further. Right? We capture the image. The sensor picks up which ones are red, green, and blue. Then it translates it out into strings of computer code, ones and zeros. And then we look at it in Photoshop and see the digital image. Okay? So that's the process through which your camera goes. Then we have these options. right? And these are a little bit old in terms of slides. I don't think anybody has the Canon Power Shots anymore. You know, maybe my father-in-law, he loves his Canon Power Shot. Anyway, um, this is your typical point and shoot camera. Lens is fixed. You can zoom in a little bit. You've got a screen on the back. You can review your images. There are some built-in shooting modes. We'll talk about what those are in just a second. Then we have your digital SLR. The big difference between your phone a point and shoot camera and the digital SLR is you can change lenses. You can get different lenses to put on. You can get bigger apertures with lenses. You can put telephoto lenses on, right? those kinds of things. That's what a digital SLR is for. The trade off is that it's really bulky. Right? If you carry it around, it's awkward. Okay? You get better quality photos out of it, but it's awkward because you're carrying it around. So if I can, 
if I can have you take one thing away from this whole lecture about photography, it is that your camera has more than auto mode in it. Okay? Your phone may or may not have more than auto mode, but most cameras that are not your phone do have these modes built in. And so if you use the modes, you're going to get a better image than you would otherwise get. Okay? So let's say that I want to take something and I want the background to blur. Well, the mode you're going to go after is probably going to be portrait mode. The idea is that you have one thing that's in focus and the stuff behind blurs out. If I'm going to go take an uh, a photo of a landscape and I want to show the green hills or something like that, chances are I want everything to be in focus, so I want to go find where landscape mode is, which is going to make the aperture really small. So rather than going in and saying, I'm going to set my aperture at 1.8, you're just using one of these presets and it's doing it for you, deliberately lowering the aperture or increasing the aperture. Likewise, I want to freeze action because I'm shooting sports. Switch to sports mode. It compensates and makes the shutter speed really fast. So if you use one of those three, chances are you're going to get a better final image. If you're shooting a close-up, you're going to use the flower mode or the macro mode. It'll allow you to get really close to an object and still have it in um, exposure. Some of the more advanced cameras have this lower set where you can set a particular priority and then the camera will compensate. When I shoot with my digital SLR, I use aperture priority mode and I manually set what I want the aperture to be and then I let the camera do the rest. So it, it adjusts every, every other setting, but I can say I want to shoot an f1.8 or something like that. So you want to think about if your camera supports it, maybe one of these is good. If not, stick with the standard three or the big three. So if you do anything in this class, try to use these instead. And again, if you're stuck in your phone, you might not have these. So you have to compensate in any way you can. So a few other things. You want to think about how much space you have on your camera or on your card. Know how many pictures you intend to shoot. You're going on vacation. Oh, I'm going to shoot 1,000 photos. I'm going to shoot them all in RAW. Do I have a big enough card? Basically, did I take the images off the card that I shot the last vacation that I took? Those kinds of things. So you want to think about that. What's your final output? How large of a size do you want to shoot? Generally, I think storage space is cheap, so why not shoot in RAW? You always have all the information. So what if it costs you, well, you know, a little bit extra for a hard drive? No big deal. Okay. So if you want to, you can, you can obviously change the settings in your camera, which can be useful. In terms of carrying stuff, right, the simplest thing, I'm good to go. Right? There's a reason that we take lots of pictures with our phones, and that's because our phones generally are always on us. Right? They're always available. So it's really hard to shoot in a digital SLR if you don't have it. Right? I don't have it, therefore I don't shoot. So um, we, we, um, we recently went to Disneyland with my kids. Uh, I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old. Right? Great time to go to Disneyland. They loved it. No surprise. And I was like, oh, I don't want to carry my big camera around. I'm just going to shoot with my phone. Right? And a couple days into the trip, I was looking at the picture and I was like, they're just not that good. You know, they're okay, but they're just, they look like phone pictures. So on the last day, I got out my digital SLR and I towed it around. And it was really annoying to carry this camera around. I got the best pictures, right? Because I had a higher quality camera. So you want to think about that. But you also have to think about all this other stuff. Do you have lens cleaners? Do you have extra batteries, right? Do you have extra lenses? Oh, I'm going to switch from my fixed 50 millimeter lens to my 35. Right? Oh, I want a fisheye. Right? Do I carry this giant backpack? All that kind of stuff. Right? If you're going to shoot something, you want to make sure that it's OK to take pictures. Right? Some places prohibit you from taking pictures. You want to be aware of that. Some people don't want you to take their picture, and they get really cranky if you do, if you don't know them. So you might want to be aware of that. Okay? For your exercise today, I ask you to take pictures of people. Right? You may or may not want to talk to the people first kind of up to you, right? They might get mad at you. You can obviously ask other people in the class. That would be fine. Um, but that is part of the requirement, so you have to think through that, right? The other thing is you want to look at the weather and think about, what do I do, OK? It will rain on you, right? This was part of that Peru trip. This is when we went up to Machu Picchu. And we were all set to do the Inca Trail and do this big hike. It was great. 
except it was pouring rain, right? And so here we are with all our laptops and our camera gear, and we're hiking the Inca Trail trying to figure out how to stay dry, okay? So you want to be aware. Some camera bags have, have uh, built-in weather covers that you can flip out uh, and cover up your work. We obviously, some of the people did ponchos, et cetera, right? So you got to be aware of that. I, we'll we'll talk, talk about this in one second, but I have to, anybody been to Machu Picchu before? Now, so obviously I went through architecture school, I went through architectural history class, you know, heard them talk about Machu Picchu, and I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever, you know, it wasn't my thing, you know, talk to me about Rome, yeah, Rome's awesome, you know, okay, but Machu Picchu, yeah, whatever. So we did this uh, as part of the field school. We did the, the field school first, we, we were in Tambo, Colorado, and I'll show you a few pictures of that a little bit later on. We were in Tambo, Colorado for th three or four weeks or something like that, and after we did the field school, it was like, okay, well, we're in Peru, we ought to go see the, the real Peru stuff that you really want to see, right? Well, one of which was, of course, Machu Picchu. It was like, okay. So we go to Machu Picchu, um, and we took, we decided we were gonna do the Inca Trail, and we got off the, the train, you can train to Machu Picchu, so you don't actually have to hike, but we were like, no, it'll be cooler if we hike. So we get off the train at five in the morning, it's pouring rain, and it's like, okay, well, we're gonna do this hike. And of course it's in the Andes, so it's high altitude. So you're hiking between like 10,000 and 15,000 feet or something. I mean, it's ridiculous and you can't breathe and all the rest of it. So we get on this hike um, and we're going and it's pouring rain and it's kind of miserable and your feet are wet and all the rest of it. And you stop halfway and you have lunch and it was starting to break up a little bit, but everything was still muddy and you're tired and all the rest of it. And so you're going along and you're like, okay, well, we must be getting close to Machu Picchu at some point, okay? And so we're hiking along, hiking along, hiking along, and we go around this little bend, and all of a sudden you turn and there's this staircase, and it's like 8,000 miles long, and you're like, you're kidding me, right? Like, I cannot do this. But it's like, okay, we can do it, and here's our laptop, and so we hike up these stairs. The, when you hike the Inca Trail, and you do this thing, you arrive at the Sun Gate, which is how you were supposed to arrive in Machu Picchu to begin with, okay? So we got up there and you're slogging away and you crest this, this hill, this staircase. And at that moment, like the sun broke through the clouds and it was probably the most spectacular moment ever. It was like you could see all of Machu Picchu and one of the things that you, you see pictures of Machu Picchu and, and whatever and you see you know, Machu Picchu itself. But you have no idea how steep the canyons are and how big the mountains are on the other sides, right? And so you come out and it's like this like, ha ah, moment, right? And the sun clears and it was, it was Unbelievable, okay? For, for coming from somebody who was like, yeah, Machu Picchu, whatever, it was spectacular. It was like, you know, it was amazing. So if you ever have the opportunity to do it, totally worth it. And definitely do the hike park because it's way cooler than arriving in a bus. If you arrive in a bus, you arrive at the bottom and you see like the visitor hut. It's totally not the same thing, right? So do it that way. Total side story, not relevant to anything, but such is life. So let's talk about composition techniques. Okay, this is the other big takeaway from today, is that we wanna talk about how do, you, how do you compose an image so that that particular image grabs the viewer's attention and makes them interested in what you're trying to show them. Okay? So we have a variety of compositional techniques to get at this. The first type would be telling a story. Okay? We, we show an image, we want somebody to imagine a story that's related to the image. Right? And a lot of times this is done with light in the image. Right, how light falls through an image, it, it makes you involved. Um, there also could be elements in the photo, roads, trails, something that causes the viewer to follow into the image. Okay? So let's see some examples. Okay? So this was an image that I, uh, that I shot in St. Peter's in Rome. Totally not the best image ever. Okay? It was kind of blurry, not so good. But it was one of these really cool moments where the sun was coming through this window and it was illuminating people. Right? So it's, it's about the experience of being in this kind of a church and, and the, the, the size and the depth and all that. It starts to tell a story. Right? So we look at it in that context. I wish I had a better camera when I was shooting at that point. Okay? It's like old school three megapixel camera. Yeah. This is in Switzerland in the Swiss Alps. Right? We have this trail that follows right along this ridge here. And it weaves its way all the way back, all the way back, all the way along here, et cetera. So we've got an element that follows through the image. And so that element can start to tell a story. It can activate the scene. You're sitting here looking at it, and you naturally start to trace that trail. 
then you start to look for other little bits of trails. Right? It causes you to be actively engaged in the image itself. This was in the Andes Mountains, again, kind of that, that clearing. You have the clouds, you have the rain, and then all of a sudden you have these beams of sun coming through. And it activates the scene. Okay? Then we have something, symmetry. Okay? We take an image, we carefully line it up so that we have symmetrical on both sides, vertically or horizontally. But the key to something like this is how do you break the symmetry? There should be something in the image that isn't symmetrical. And that's what activates the scene. So let's look at this image, the Brooklyn Bridge. Anybody walked across the Brooklyn Bridge before? It's really cool, right? Cool bridge. So we take this image, we set it up so it's perfectly symmetrical, right? We've got the cables on both sides, you've got the flag at the top, right? It's a nice symmetrical image. And then you have something that's out of balance. All the people are on one side of the bridge, right? It happens to be that this is the bike lane and this is the people lane, right? And of course, we all follow the rules for unknown reasons, but we just do, right? It's programmed into us. But it's really interesting as an image because of that contrast. So the bike lane is completely empty. The people lane is completely active, right? That's what breaks the symmetry and makes the image composition strong. Does that make sense, right? So we have to think about that, right? Something like this, this is the old broken down building. We have the perfect symmetry, and then we have the pile of debris on the right. It breaks the symmetry, something different. It accentuates the fact that the, the building's falling apart. We can move on into something radial. Radial composition, I think, is one of the hardest ones to do. It's very specific. Obviously, you have to have something that's circular for it to work. If you're going to make it successful, you need some focal point of this. And it usually starts right at the center of the image and works its way out from there. So this was in an ice cave in Switzerland. Uh, another really fun thing, if you ever go to Switzerland, go ice climbing, because it's awesome. It was really hard and kind of crazy, but it was fun. right? So this was in an ice cave. And there's this really cool tension between those two melted pieces of ice. right? And so this would be a radial composition, because we start at that center point and everything in the composition radiates around that tension. Something like this would also be radial. right? We have the picture of the tunnel. It, it goes off into infinity at one point, And everything relates around that one center point. All the lines um, go off of that. I really like this image. I didn't shoot it. right? But again, very specific. We've got the, the, the balloon, the hot air balloon. As it's starting to inflate or come down or whatever, we've got the center point and all the lines radiate from it. And then we have the, the shadows of the people that are working against it. Really, really nice composition. But again, radial is kind of specific. And you have to think carefully about how it's, how it's composed and what the subject matter is for it to be strong. Diagonal is another strong compositional technique. If you have strong diagonals in an image, a lot of times it can activate the image as well. This was up in Sea Ranch. Right? This might look familiar. This is the book stop or whatever drop thing over by the, the bookstore. Right? You've got strong horizontal and vertical lines, and then you've got the diagonals. So that starts to activate the composition as well. Right? Another di strong diagonal here. We've got the train on the tracks. That's a very strong diagonal. Everything else is almost pitch black. But we really see that strong diagonal as part of this image. Overlapping layers, this is usually uh, uh, something that's used in architectural photography a lot, where you have one thing in front of another. You shoot through one thing to show something else. So here we have the, the mud dwellings at Tambo, Colorado. We shoot through the door to see the next layer, which has the niche and the window. Through that, we see the next wall. So we're going through a series of layers. right? This is what it looks like from outside, just so you can have some context. Right. This was the, the site that we were spending all our time field schooling uh, and documenting and whatever. Uh, it's supposed to have, it never rains here, and it's supposed to have some of the best preserved wall paintings uh, from that era. So it's interesting from an archaeological standpoint. So here's another example here. It's kind of blurry. I don't know what happened. Uh, but this is just a true landscape shot. But if we look at this in layers, it's, it's a little bit untraditional. It's not the same as what I was talking about. But we've got the front, the foreground of this grassy hill. right? That's one layer. Then we move to the pond. That's the next layer. Then we move to the trees behind the pond. That's the next layer. Then we move to the fog behind that. 
Then we move beyond the fog to the horizon. So we're working through a series of layers as part of this overall composition. Right? So that series of layers really accentuates this particular image. So then we get to the last one, well, second to last one. And this is the one that if you don't do anything else, if you just mentally get this in your head, you will instantly become a better photographer. And it's called the rule of thirds. It's really easy to follow. Some cameras even will do this for you, where they divide up the screen into a grid. Anybody have this turned on on their iPhone? Even your iPhone will do it, OK? Turn it on in your iPhone, OK? What it's doing is it's saying, compose the focal points or the points of interest in your image on those lines. And I'll show you a bunch of examples here. Okay, so we, we're in New York, we have the Statue of Liberty. Okay? The default photograph of this is to center it in the, in the middle of the image. Okay? This is not exciting. It's not an active image. Okay, let's say, for example, hold on a second. Let's see if I can get a piece of paper here. I don't want a grid. OK. So let's say I have an image, right? something like that. And if I put the focal point of the image right there, right, even space around it. So from there to there is even, from there to there is even. Okay? When I do this, right, all of the space around the person doesn't matter. Right? You just focus on the person. If, however, I take the person and I put the person over here, right, the person is on one third of the photo. There's one third, right? There's two thirds. Okay? This space now matters. We care about what's in that space. So let's go back to the Statue of Liberty. Okay? If we look at it, there's our one third line. We take it a step further, and we have a one-third line at the bottom here. So we set the ground there. We set the statue here. And all of this space matters now in the composition. Notice that she's looking this way. If she was looking the opposite way, you'd want the space on the other side. But it takes the focal point of the image and activates it to the surroundings. Let's look at another example. Okay? So we have a rainstorm in Maine. Okay? We compose the image so that the bow of the boat right, shows up on that one third line. The boat itself shows up on the third line horizontally. And then, whoops, sorry. And we start to activate this scene just in simple composition. Next one is the actual person. Right? This is the example I was talking about. Okay? If I compose this person so that he's on the one third line and I make his eyes at the third line at the top, right? you look at this image, you see the person, and you say, I wonder what he's looking at. Right? You think about the person in the context of the surroundings, as opposed to just the person. Okay? If, however, I compose the image this way, right? it still meets the one-third rule, the rule of thirds. There he is on the third. There he is on the third. Does this work? It, 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 technically, right, it technically works from a rule of thirds, but he's looking off the page, and we've got the creepy monster that's coming in from behind that's going to eat him, right? or whatever you want to think of it as. So it doesn't really work from a great composition standpoint, because we don't care about this space. We care about the space that's over here. Right? That's what activates it. So don't blindly follow it. Think about where the people are looking as part of the composition. Okay? And we can go faster through the next one. This one, I think you could argue that it's a diagonal too. But in this case, there it is on the 1 third. Right? I think it has a really strong diagonal this way as well, obviously, with the blades of the helicopter the opposite direction. So it could be either one. Right? Another example here, right? activating the space behind, there's the 1 third. OK, so here's the typical, I hiked the mountain. I'm so proud of myself. Right? Anybody taken this kind of picture before? Right? And typically, I'm proud of myself. Image gets right here. That's all you get. If, however, you take this particular image and you compose it with the rule of thirds, you suddenly have all of this context. I hiked the mountain, and look what I hiked. 
It's a much more active image. Okay? So take the people, shift them off center. Shift them to that one third mark, and your images will be significantly better. Just a simple landscape shot up in Sea Ranch, same compositional technique. There's the one third line, right? The big foliage is all in that. There's our lower line, and there's our upper line, right? We, we frame this around that third rule. Framing, another style uh, of doing this. This is when you shoot through one object to represent uh, another object. So this is in Pompeii. We shoot through the ocular window. That then serves as a frame for the surroundings. Patterns and repetition. If you pay careful attention to patterns, they can be a great photograph to shoot, especially when something doesn't belong. So kind of like symmetry, where we're looking for something that doesn't fit, Patterns and competition work the same way. So we look at this, pretty cool image, right? We've got the hotel, all the balconies are the same, all the chairs are in exactly the same position, except there's a swimsuit hanging on the rail in one of them. Right? It's the one thing that's interesting. It's the one thing that breaks. Now, if I were actually composing this, I didn't shoot it, I would have shot it so that the swimsuit was on the rule of thirds. Right? So that the interesting thing was, was off center as opposed to being straight. But it's still something in contrast to a pattern. Right? Here we go, similar repetition. And then we've got the person moving through the space. So the activation of this pattern. Another example here, we've got a series of parallel pieces. And then the snow is creeping over. So it's the thing that, that breaks the pattern. Okay, so you want to think about that in contrast to patterns and rep repetition. Okay, so I'm done talking about all my photography stuff, but you have an exercise today, and that is that you're going to go out and take some actual pictures. And you're going to bring those pictures to class on Wednesday. We need those so we can start in Photoshop, you can start your post-processing. Uh, before you go, I want you to browse online and I want you to find an image that fits one of these compositional strategies that we talked about today. And I want you to, to post that image with a link to that image. And then also tell me what is working about this particular composition. Okay? What technique did they use? Is it working? Is it not working? That sort of thing. You're going to make that post. right? Then you're going to go out and photograph a variety of things that we'll talk about in just a second. If you want to take the morning off and do something else, that's cool. You can do this some other time between now and Wednesday. You do, however, have to do it on campus before Wednesday. Make sense? OK, so here's the list. I want five photographs of campus buildings. Anything that's interesting to you, right? whatever, whatever works is fine with me. Okay? If you can surprise me and take a shot I haven't seen before, I love it. Right? I've been doing this for a long time. I've seen a lot of pictures. Okay? So think about it that way. Right? Five images of people walking, right? grouping together, singing, I don't know. Right? Something, people. This is where you may want to ask them first, hey, do you mind if I take your picture? Right? Maybe not. Maybe you just take their picture and hope that they don't get mad at you. Right? Five detail images of patterns and or textures. Remember what I talked about. Right? If you're doing a pattern, what doesn't belong? It's always a good way of looking at it. Okay? Five photographs taken from unexpected angles. This one's always fun. People come up with good stuff from this. Right? Four close-up photographs. So I say macro, meaning close-up, right? tight in, etc. If you can do it, one bracketed set of images. This means three exposures. One is your regular exposure. One, maybe use exposure compensation to deliberately darken and deliberately lighten the other two image. So one correctly exposed, one darker, one light and lighter, all of the same shot, same composition. This is for the high dynamic range part of the, the class that we'll cover in a week and a half or so. It may or may not work out where you use your images. I have samples if yours don't work out. So I'd like you to try. Okay. I want you to take a handheld set of panorama images. So some cameras, like iPhones, allow you to just do the swing. right? Don't just do the swing. I'd like you to take 
three or four or six overlapping images. Okay, so make sure they overlap. We're going to use Photoshop to actually stitch those images together. So individual photos, three, four, five, six, whatever. Okay? Again, I'll have sample images. If yours don't turn out, I have samples for you to practice with. Uh, I want you to take a self-portrait, okay? And then I want you to take 25 or more images of your choice, not on campus, okay? Before Wednesday. We're going to work with a group of images. You're going to pick a few of your images, the best ones, and then we'll work with them on Wednesday. Okay? This is all in preparation for your first assignment, which will be your best photo. I'll hand that assignment out on Wednesday. Okay? But you're just kind of getting ready for it. You're going to take pictures. You are not, for that assignment, allowed to use something uh, that you shot prior to the start of the semester. Right? So even though you had this awesome winter break and you went to Rome and you shot all these great pictures, you can't use them. Okay? has to be after the start of the semester that you can take them. Okay? Um, and that's so that it's an even playing field. Right? You can't take the Rome picture and have better subject matter than somebody else. Right? Even playing field. You all live here in the Bay Area. You can take pictures from here. Um, if you really want a challenge, okay, you can try to take, and I've thought about making this the actual assignment, but I haven't done it yet. I haven't decided that it's worth it. Um, you could try to take 30 images of your mailbox. Okay? And on the surface, it's like, oh yeah, I got that. No problem. I can take 30 pictures in my mailbox. Okay? So you say, okay, I'm going to take it from every angle, and that's like eight. And then I open the mailbox, and I have put mail in it, and then I you know, close it, I put the flag up. Right? And you go through, and you get to about 22. And then it gets really hard. Okay? So I've had a couple students do this along the way, and they've, they've really enjoyed it. But again, it's not your actual assignment. But if you want to challenge yourself, try it. Um, it's much harder than it looks. Okay, so the reason that um, after you make your post, I turn you loose is because you can use your remaining you know, hour and a half or so to photograph right now. That's during class. If you choose not to do it during class, you have to put in that hour and a half some other time. That makes sense? Okay, so it's up to you. Uh, good news for you is the lighting conditions are reasonably good right now. It's a little on the cold side to be outside, but you have pretty good light. Right? When I taught this as the night class, it was like, well, too bad. <laughs> you have to do it some other time. Um, but the good news is you have decent light, so you can, you can do it. Are there any questions about this? No? Make sense? Yeah. You, however you feel comfortable is fine with me. If you, bring, you know, if you shoot them on your phone, you can look through them and you can email them to yourself on Wednesday when we're in class because you're going to need some to process. If you want to bring um, you know, your SD card, you can stick it in to these computers. They have a card reader. If you want to bring a cable and connect your phone, you can do it that way. Uh, generally, you know, email is probably the easiest way of getting them off your phone. Um, you're more than welcome to use your phones for this assignment. If you have a digital camera, all the better, use your digital camera, uh, especially if you have a digital SLR, you'll get better image quality out of it. But hey, I get it. When I first started teaching in class, you know, it was like you had a Motorola Razor, and people were like, can I shoot with that? I'm like, yeah, not so good. You know, but now phones on your, you know, are pretty good. And so it's realistic to think that that's, 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 you could do everything here uh, with your phone. Any other questions? No? All right, so make sure you do your post. And then uh, after your post, you're free to go. Take those pictures and bring them um, in, cla uh, in class on Wednesday. You do not need to come back at the end of class. Okay, So once you leave, you're good. Make sense? All right. Nope, you didn't have to sign in. I'm going to do roll momentarily, and uh, then you'll be free to go.